Hello, and thanks for tuning in to this video on the SBTI's Net Zero Standard. In this video, I'll be going over the SBTI's Net Zero Foundations, giving you the background that you need to understand the rationale behind the SBTI's draft Net Zero criteria and the direction that we're headed with the Net Zero Standard. I'll start by going over the history and how we got to the point that we're at. I'll review some of the global science around limiting warming to one and a half degrees and reaching net zero at the global level. Then I'll review the SBTI's guiding principles for uh, net zero corporate targets. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about how the SBTI's definition of net zero might vary from existing corporate climate neutrality targets. So to start with, how did we get here? I think we can start by looking at the Paris Agreement adoption in 2015, which is also the year that several first companies set approved SBTs with the SBTI. About three years later, in October 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published its special report on global warming of one and a half degrees, more on that later. And shortly after that, the SBTI released its new suite of resources, enabling companies to set one and a half degree aligned SBTs. A few months later, the SBTI published a working paper on net zero and started to gather stakeholder feedback on its definition and guiding principles for net zero. And last year, in September 2020, we published the foundations of net zero target setting in the corporate sector, which really articulates this uh, quite clearly, uh, incorporates stakeholder feedback and also marks the start of our net zero standard development process. So let's look at the science of aiming for one and a half degrees. First off, it's worth noting that the SBTI's net zero standard really does revolve around this more ambitious goal of the Paris Agreement. And part of the reason why is that with the publication of the special report on global warming of one and a half degrees, Many of us came to understand that the climate impacts of this level of warming are worse than we had thought. The table on the right of this slide shows the climate impacts associated with one and a half degrees of warming compared to two degrees of warming. And that special report published by the IPCC really underlined the importance of the one and a half degree goal in global climate action efforts. On the left here, you'll see that we are still very far off from the one and a half degree goal. And even with existing pledges, targets, and current policies, we're still looking at around two and a half degrees of warming. So there's quite a long way to go. The special report on global warming of one and a half degrees makes clear that there are a variety of pathways that could limit warming to one and a half degrees, but almost all of them require reaching net zero CO2 emissions by mid-century accompanied by rapid declines in non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions. This is accomplished through rapid and profound transitions in the global energy, industry, urban, and land systems that involve full or near full decarbonization of the energy system and industry, eliminating CO2 emissions from agriculture, forestry, and land use, deep reductions in non-CO2 emissions from all sectors, and removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to neutralize the impact of all residual emissions, and in some cases, bring atmospheric concentrations of CO2 back down. To simplify this picture, we can look at net zero at the global level and what that entails. In our current state, we are seeing anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions that far outweigh the carbon removals that are occurring from the atmosphere. To reach net zero at the global level, we need to reach a state in which anthropogenic emissions do not accumulate in the atmosphere at all. And that can be achieved by reducing our emissions very near zero and removing any unabated emissions um, through carbon dioxide removal. Researchers have explored a wide range of scenarios that limit warming to one and a half degrees. But what's clear is that the lower the level of emissions reductions in the near term, the higher the need to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at a later time to stabilize temperatures or bring temperatures back down. While some level of atmospheric CO2 removal 
is necessary and can be achieved in synergy with other social and environmental goals. The deployment of CO2 removal approaches at large scale is subject to a number of uncertainties and constraints, including potentially adverse effects on the environment and trade-offs with other sustainable development goals. For the most part, we know that reducing emissions quickly in the near term over the next 10 to 15 years is the safest way of limiting warming to one and a half degrees with the lowest possible risks. This chart on the left shows um, across these different scenarios, the actual amount of land that's dedicated to energy crops, which is one of the main contributors to carbon removal through bioenergy, carbon capture and storage in these scenarios. And you can see that in the scenarios with higher overshoot shown in the last slide, the ones labeled P3 and P4, the amount of land that's needed to contribute to this carbon removal is as large or larger than, than the country of Australia. Um, again, we know that this is associated with potentially negative side effects and acknowledging these different risks and trade-offs. The SBTI approach to net zero recommends using mitigation pathways with no or limited overshoot. Back to the SBTI's net zero definition. In November of 2019, the SBTI published its working paper toward a science-based approach to climate neutrality in the corporate sector. And more than 500 participants tuned in to the launch webinar. And we received more than 80 written responses to a follow-up survey about the net zero principles laid out in that webinar and paper. The first principle was that corporate net zero targets and claims should result in no net impact on the climate. The second was that they should be made in line with one and a half degree mitigation pathways. The third and fourth mainly relate to companies' strategy and investments and how those relate to a net zero economy. The feedback that we got was strongly in support of principles one and two, and still mainly in support of principles three and four as well. In our publication last year, uh, the foundations of net zero target setting, we refined the guiding principles and incorporated the feedback, ending up with three guiding principles instead of four. I'll go through them now. The first principle is that reaching net zero emissions for a company involves achieving a state in which its value chain results in no net accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere and in no net impact from other greenhouse gas emissions. The second is that in accordance with the best available science, the Paris Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals, companies should transition toward net zero in line with mitigation pathways that limit warming to one and a half degrees with no or limited overshoot. The third and final guiding principle that we laid out is that the mitigation strategy followed by the company should inform long-term strategies and investments that mitigate the company's exposure to climate-related transition risks ensuring that its business model will continue to be viable in a net zero economy. In that same foundations paper, we laid out a set of 10 high level recommendations. I'm not gonna read the full text on these slides, but please do feel free to read it yourself or review the foundations paper where these are included in the executive summary. Lastly, I'm gonna review some of the mitigation tactics, which are actions that companies take to achieve their net zero target. And then I'm gonna leave you with a comparison of how the SBTI's net zero standard and definition of net zero might vary from existing corporate climate neutrality targets. In this slide, we lay out the different uh, actions that companies take and how they relate to a net zero target. Mitigation tactics. Abatement are actions that companies take to prevent, reduce, or eliminate sources of greenhouse gas emissions within its value chain. These are the actions that companies take to achieve their existing science-based targets, resulting in value chain emissions reductions. Neutralization are actions that companies take to remove carbon from the atmosphere in order to counterbalance the impact of any unabated source of emissions. 
use can occur inside or outside the value chain of the company. Compensation are actions that companies take to prevent, reduce, or eliminate sources of emissions outside of their value chain. These are often associated with traditional carbon credits or offsets. And on the right here, you can see how each of these actions is in theory tied to different physical effects on the climate. So abatement and compensation both should result in a reduction in emissions, but the difference is whether it occurs inside or outside the value chain of the company. Neutralization results in carbon removal from the atmosphere. And at a state of net zero, we know that at a global level, emissions will have needed to be fully abated and fully neutralized. I'll leave you with this slide, which is how does the SBTS definition of net zero differ from existing corporate climate neutrality targets? The first bullet point here is that the standard itself is really guided by the science of what's needed to reach net zero at a global level and the three guiding principles that were laid out in this presentation. The second bullet point here is that net zero targets address the endpoint of a company's emissions abatement journey more than a transitional state where companies might rely on a greater volume of offsetting. I think this is a key point because by comparison to corporate net zero targets or the target year of, for example, 2025 or 2030, the targets that would meet the criteria in our standard need to go further and bring the company to a state where its business activity is aligned with a net zero economy. The third bullet point here is that net zero targets must include a specific minimum amount of emissions abatement in the value chain to be validated by the SBTI, um, and more on that in, in a separate video. And the fourth point here is that the SBTI's net zero standard differentiates between offsets that result in avoided emissions or emissions reductions versus those that result in carbon removal. I hope this background has been useful. Um, and please do tune in to the other videos in this series if you'd like to hear more about these topics as you contribute to our public consultation. Thanks for listening.